When We Awake by Glenn Hall, Chapter 4, Part 2, Repentance from Sin, the First Christian Work. The book of Hebrews places repentance first in its list of elementary doctrines in the following passage from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Unless we learn this primary lesson well, the writer says, we can never go on unto perfection. The normal Christian life, according to John, is life without sin. But if anyone sins, he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. From the very beginning, God provided a means by which the one who does sin may once again become clean before him. That way, in the Old Testament for the Hebrews, was the trespass offering. And its theological equivalent today is repentance. Now that the one offering of Jesus Christ has been made, we no longer have to sacrifice animals to God. But we do need to pray for our advocate for continuing forgiveness. Failure to repent of sin is one of the most telling signs that we stand at the very end of the age. Lawlessness and, re- and unrepentance mark today's Laodicean Christians in their institutionalized form of godliness. The book of Revelation tells us about the Laodiceans. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, Jesus says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Laodicean and Revelation's other six churches actually existed at the time John wrote this prophecy. It's also true that the seven churches prophetically correspond to different time periods in church history or different aspects of the church in church history. Thus, they serve as prophetic types in God's word. The Laodicean church is last in John's list, and it characterizes the the end-of-the-age church, which includes the multitude of today's denominations and independent churches. Our churches possess huge buildings and vast worldly estates, but in terms of obedience and spiritual revelation, they are, according to Christ, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Indeed, lawlessness represents the most telling earmark in many of Christ's churches at the dawn of the third day, the third millennium since his birth. Rarely will you hear a pastor or teacher exalt God's standards in ways specific enough to convince his people that the lives they live are full of sin and debauchery. Today's church and world events fulfill Paul's prophecy to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 9. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, 
brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janes and Yambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. 2 Timothy 3, 1-9 through nine. If Christians cannot even repent, and thus offer the most basic of the five sacrifices, how will we ever enter into the sanctuary, much less the most holy place of God's actual presence? John says, And now little children abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 1 John 2.28 Yes, even a Christian may be ashamed of himself when he comes again. The purpose then of the ashame or trespass offering was not to bring initial salvation or one's first forgiveness of sins. It provided a means by which a believer could maintain forgiveness and purity before God for his intentional and unintentional sins and thus remain unashamed before him. The trespass offering did not represent an Israelite's initial forgiveness from sin or establish his relationship with God. The Passover sacrifice accomplished that. In Exodus 12, 13, it says, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Passover sacrifice and its blood on a Hebrew door was a sign. That is, it was a historic event with specific prophetic implications. Laodicean Christians, you see, were and are rich, at least in a worldly way. Jesus said, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. In Mark 10, 25. Surely most Christians stare in astonishment when they become confronted with scriptures that warn them that they may well miss participation in the kingdom of God. So did Jesus' own disciples. For the scripture says, And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Mark 10, 26. Here once again we see scriptures dealing with the salvation of the soul, not one's initial spiritual salvation. In answer to this question, Jesus says, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. That was Mark 10, 27. So there is hope for us. The prophetic goal of the trespass offerings. The trespass offering of Leviticus 5, verse 1 through 6, verse 7, dealt with God's boundaries upon man's activities. To trespass means to go beyond a point where you have the legal right to go. Webster's Dictionary defines trespass as an actionable wrong against another's person, property, or rights. The word actionable means that one can be brought into a court of law for conviction and determination of the proper punishment. Another of Webster's definitions for trespass is a sin. To trespass the boundaries of God's law is to sin. As Paul says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's Romans 3 verse 20. Whenever someone mistakenly or knowingly violated God's law, he was to bring a trespass offering to the bronze altar that stood in the court of the tabernacle. Judgment would there be made upon the offering on behalf of the offerer. The offering would atone for the sin of the offerer. The trespass offering pictures the first steps in our walk with God. It pictures the very first works of a newborn Christian, which is repentance of both intentional and unintentional sins. God's first requirement after faith comes is to obey him with the help of the Holy Spirit. The trespass offering showed God's provision of forgiveness by repentance from the very beginning. 
Today we offer prayers of forgiveness to our advocate, Jesus Christ. This is the antitype or the prophetic goal of the trespass offering. The ultimate goal of all Christians should be to dwell in the presence of God. David cries, How lovely is your tab- tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. That was Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2, and verse 10. Hebrews declares, Without holiness no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, verse 14. The trespass offering and its prophetic application, prayers of repentance to Jesus Christ, help us to achieve this goal. Trespass types of sin. Number one, the first sin of the trespass group deals with hearing the utterance of a false oath and refusing to tell the truth to the civil authorities about the matter, even though one is an eyewitness to the truth of the issues involved. That's in Leviticus 5, verse 1. Such refusal to uphold the law in society breaks down the social order especially in a nation like Israel, which was supposed to be based upon God's perfect law. We have witnessed many examples of this type of sin in recent well-publicized trials of important political and entertainment figures. The refusal to tell the truth in a court of law destroys the entire legal system. It is impossible to reach a just result when witnesses lie under oath. All of society ultimately suffers from this breach. The specific intentional sins mentioned in Leviticus 6 regarding the shame offering also relate to sins of lying, <clears throat> relate to sins of lying. Lies and deception characterize the lawless time in which we live, and unfortunately, even many Christians who live in these times. To lie and to deceive exhibit characteristics totally contrary to God's will for our lives. Deceptive Christians may claim God is their father, but Jesus' words will condemn them, just as they did the Pharisees. He said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, verse 44. John proclaims, that all liars, including Christians, will have their place in the fiery lake of burning sulfur in Revelation 21, verse 8. He also declares that liars, including Christians, will have their place outside the kingdom and the city of God in Revelation 22, verse 15. This is the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth and the outer darkness that Jesus repeatedly warns his people about. Number two, the second type of sins in the ashamed trespass group relates to mistakenly or unintentionally becoming unclean. That's in Leviticus 5, verses 2 and 3. The Hebrews were required not to touch certain things like dead animals. These requirements mainly concerned ritualistic or ceremonial laws that do not usually specifically apply to Christians. Nevertheless, they carry prophetic import and application. God commands Christians to maintain a life of separation from the ways of the world. But sometimes we become unclean unintentionally simply by living in the world. We may see a highway billboard, for example, that provokes lustful or covetous thoughts. We need to learn to take every thought captive to Christ immediately and repent of any uncleanness we allow to enter our souls. Thus, we may still apply this aspect of the ashamed offering to our walk with God. Number three, the third type of trespass relates to vows of the mouth to do evil or to do good. In Leviticus 5, verse 4, Jesus teaches us to answer yes or no and not to take oaths at all. In Matthew 5, verses 33 to 37, he says, Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, 
nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. We must learn to control our tongues, as James so forcefully warns us. He likens our tongue to a spring that pours forth both fresh and bitter water, since we both bless and curse with our mouth. He asks, does the spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? James 3.11. Clearly the answer is no. And then he asks, who is wise and understanding among you? In verse three, verse thir- or chapter 3, verse 13. And we've come to a mystery again. J- James also teaches, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a mature man, able also to bridle the whole body. That's chapter 3, verse 2. The trespass offering presents us with an additional step toward maturity in that it brings us into an awareness of the importance of our words. Jesus warns us, I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. That's Matthew 12, 36 and 37. We need but remember one command for our speech. Ephesians 4.15 says, Speak the truth in love. Or as David put it, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. Psalm 40 verse 10. When we end this life, let us answer, I am wise in understanding, to James' last question. And before then, let us repent of every careless word. Thus, we make our a shame offering today. Number four, the fourth type of sin here involves unintentional sins regarding the holy things of the Lord. Leviticus 5 verse 15. After all, what is God's real desire for us? In Exodus 22 verse 31, he says, and you shall be holy men to me. The word translated holy above is the Hebrew word kodesh, It first occurs in the passage where God calls to Moses from the burning bush, saying, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Exodus 3, verse 5. To be in the presence of God means to stand on holy ground. Even though unintentional, this was a very serious sin, because in addition to the shame offering, the priest imposed a 20% fine upon the offender. In Leviticus 5, verses 15 and 16. The penalty seems severe until we realize the goal of our existence, which is to dwell in the presence of God, continually beholding his face always. This goal looks forward to the table of showbread, or the table of the bread of faces, that sits before the face of God continually. John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. To chapter 3, verse 3. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, Now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Our goal, says John, is to see him as he is. However, there is only one way to really see him. We must purify ourselves. That is, we must become holy. We translate... The Old Testament Hebrew word kodesh as the word holy. A key verse using the word kodesh is Exodus 26, verse 33, which says, And you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. The words translated the most holy are in Hebrew kodesh, kodesh. So we see that the interior of the tabernacle 
is a most holy place indeed. And this is our goal, to come into the most holy place, into the Kodesh Kodesh. And I would just say here that that's why I use the word Kodeshim these days instead of the word saints that you see in the Bible all of the time. The Kodeshim are the holy ones of God. The fourth aspect of the Ashame offering then deals with unintentional mistakes regarding a sacred relationship with the holy God. This speaks of growing in the grace and knowledge of God. Clearly, when the person first committed his error, he did not know it. At some point, perhaps through the instruction of the priests or the clan elders, he did become aware of his sin. At that time, he confessed his sin and brought his trespass offering to the Lord as a sin offering. Then the priest made atonement for him concerning his sin. To repent of and to confess one's sins means the same thing. Often we learn that we should only confess positive statements about ourselves. But this would often mean that we deny truth and reality. Biblically, to confess means to speak the same thing as thus. When a sinner confesses his sin, it means that he speaks the same thing as God. This, too, defines the meaning of to confess Christ. Those who truly confess Christ speak the same word that Jesus speaks. Their words, doctrines, and actions agree with his commands. The opposite of confess, however, is to deny. Jude, in verse 4 of his book, tells us that certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated deny here is the word arneome and means to contradict, according to Strong's. Thus the mark of a false prophet or a false teacher of the last days is that his teaching contradicts or denies the very words of Christ. To be a false teacher or prophet does not mean that one does not believe in Christ. In fact, most false prophets certainly do believe that Jesus died for their sins. Why do you think it's so hard to find good, true, biblical teaching these days? It's because false teachers and prophets who believe in Christ yet deny him, that is, contradict him, fill our churches. Unfortunately, we do not know how to recognize these false teachers. This is a sign of the times. We see then that the goal of the trespass offering, like repentance for us, was to prepare one to stand unashamed in the holiness or presence of God. His thoughts regarding certain matters had come into agreement with God's, and he repented of his old ways. End of part two of chapter four of When We Awake by Glenn Hall.